Hi and welcome to episode 31 of the Trending Tech Podcast. This time it's on how integrated sims are coming and what will iSIMS do for you. Thanks for joining us for today's sometimes serious, sometimes light-hearted look at digital transformation for enterprises. Now, I'm sure you've read about iSIMS. We've certainly been writing about plans for integrated SIMS on iot-now.com since 2019. But just to recap, iSIM is a new technology enabling a SIM card's functionality to be integrated into a device's main processor. Today, we're going to be talking about iSIMS with experts from Talos, who I'm pleased to say are our sponsors today. Talos is a global technology provider with more than 81,000 employees on five continents. The group works to deliver digital innovations in big data, artificial intelligence, connectivity, cybersecurity, and quantum technology, basically the things we love to talk about. A warm welcome to you. My name's Jeremy Cowan. I'm co-founder of the telecoms and technology sites, iot-now.com, vanillaplus.com, and the ee.ai, which covers artificial intelligence for the evolving enterprise. And our first guest today is Stefan Quetglas, who is Marketing Director at Thales Digital Identity and Security, and he's also Board Director at Trusted Connectivity Alliance. Stefan, welcome. Hello, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. Great to have you here. Also joining us is Laurent Leloup, Product Line Manager at Thales Digital Identity and Security. Laurent, welcome. Thanks for inviting us. Happy to be there. Great. Last but not least, it's always a pleasure to have with us Robin Duke Woolley, CEO and founder of the international consultancy Beecham Research. Robin, great to have you here again. And you, Jeremy. Great to be here. Good. Okay, to understand ISIM, we need to look at the IE UICC GSMA specification. That is quite a mouthful, isn't it? The specification is though a milestone that enables the tech to be commercialized and iSIM could soon be rolled out in a host of new devices to connect to mobile services. In fact, Vodafone, Qualcomm Technologies and Talis have recently demonstrated a working smartphone using iSIM. iSIM allows greater system integration, higher performance and increased memory capacity. It's really the latest evolution of eSIM or of SIM technology in which eSIMs are embedded into devices. eSIMs, however, require a separate chip. With iSIM, that isn't necessary and it removes the need for dedicated space assigned to SIM services. Now, before we go any further, I always like to check the road ahead in technology with our guests. So let's take a quick look at serious tech news stories you've found. And later, as usual, we'll look for some light relief in our closing section, What the Tech. We'll discuss a couple of tech news stories that amazed or amused us. Okay, Laurent, what serious tech news have you come across? Well, I recently read an article on ZDNet about... uh... Singapore government's willingness to educate its citizens about the, the risk, uh, the cyber risk, actually. So they, they have a, a cyber security agency, which created a task force. And one of the things they did, for instance, was to create what they called an internet hygiene portal. So on this portal, actually, any user can type any web address they want. And this web address uh, will be checked about the latest protocol standards, uh, security standards. Uh, So you can check that, uh, for instance, if you use an e-commerce site, uh, it is actually secure. Or you can uh, also, as an enterprise, check your your um, your website to check if it implements the latest security measures. And so, this uh, cybersecurity agency want to not only educate the the, the citizens uh, about the cyber risk, but also they want to create a task force to to improve um, several stuff like. Uh, they want to safeguard the critical information infrastructures like the energy grids, uh, to create an interagency countermeasure, uh, counter ransomware unit, 
uh, they, they want to improve international cooperation. So all that so shows that some governments are really taking this seriously to, to try to improve the, the cyber security risk. Indeed. I, I think a round of applause for Singapore, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I wish more countries were taking uh, these kind of proactive measures, obviously helping citizens to identify sites that are protecting their visitors is a great idea and obviously anything also that takes steps to cut out phishing for consumers and ransomware for businesses i think we need to keep a, a lookout for more stories on this so i'll be watching out for this thank you for raising this laurent um as iot devices achieve massive scale i think this is going to become increasingly important robin what did you make of this Yes, no, I uh, I totally agree, and I think that uh, as you say, sort of hats off to uh, to Singapore actually for drawing attention to this and uh, trying to get their citizens involved in looking at their security and uh, trying to uh, make their security better. I think that uh, trying to get citizens involved in that is a really interesting way forward and important as well, yeah. um, because it's not just up to the authorities to get things right. This is a, an open space for uh, everybody that participates in, and uh, there is a responsibility that comes with that. So I think that uh, making that clear um, by uh, Singapore, I think, is a, a very good point. Yeah, I like the parallel with hygiene because you get mm. that when you go into a restaurant and you see the hygiene or otherwise of the restaurant. It's great to see this done for websites. Yeah. We'll post the links to all of today's stories as we go through them later in the podcast. These will be in the podcast transcript so anyone can follow up the stories that we talk about. Thank you, guys. Um, let's look at iSIMS, which goes to the heart of today's podcast. Uh, Laurent, let's rewind for a moment, shall we? What exactly are integrated SIMs and who's going to benefit from them? Okay, so to understand integration, we have to understand what is a system on chip, which is abbreviated as a SOC. When you have a complex device with many functions, like for instance, uh, smartphones with you know, audio treatments, graphics processing units, Wi-Fi, cellular modem, uh, so you can go on with the list. And when such devices are sold in very large volumes, it's always beneficial to design a single chip that will embed all the functionalities rather than using several discrete chips. Because a single chip with multiple functions will be much cheaper than if you have to buy many chips, each entering a single function. And it will also allow to reduce power consumption, to have a smaller footprint on the printed circuit board of your device. So that's the benefits of integration. And the next step in this integration journey is uh, inside the system on chip to include a secure area which will be able to host the SIM operating system. And so who will benefit from them? Actually, all device makers, whether on consumer market or IoT market, will benefit from it as it will allow to have a simpler build of materials because you don't have to buy one discrete component. Uh, it will also reduce further the power consumption, free space on the device motherboard. So all those things are very important for many IoT devices. That's great. Yeah. So just picking that up to uh, Stefan, perhaps I could ask you, how do iSIMs move the game on from eSIMs? Why do we need them? Yeah, so Laurent explained a number of benefits brought by the integrated SIM. Um, what is important uh, to uh, consider is that the, the variety of devices that, that are being connected and will be connected in the future to cellular networks is increasing greatly. So that brings new needs and new requirements. Um, for instance, 10 years ago, we are not talking about connecting a smart label to, to a cellular network to track uh, some uh, sensitive goods, for instance when uh, shipping them to, to to the final customer. And today, that's a use case that exists. So you can imagine that in this such a, a small uh, product that is labeled uh, basically uh, stuck on a, on a box, uh, you cannot put a, a separate SIM or, or separate eSIM. Uh, so here, integration is very, very important. I think that uh, the, the main reason for, for having integrated SIM is that these devices that are connected uh, are changing in terms of shape, in terms of function as well, and they are going uh, smaller and smaller, running most of the time on battery. So the low power consumption that Laurent mentioned is also very, very important. The integrated SIM is bringing these benefits. It's also like an embedded SIM able to bring the same flexibility uh, in terms of uh, 
connectivity management, uh, you can remotely change it. You can remotely manage the connectivity for the connected device. And that's uh, an evolution uh, in terms of uh, form factor and performance over the eSIM. But the, the core value and the core benefit of the eSIM will remain as well. That's, uh, that's great. Now, in the early days of eSIM, embedded SIM, uh, there was a danger of uh, fragmentation of the market with uh, proprietary uh, versions. Is there a danger of that happening with, uh, with iSIM? I mean, as far as eSIM is concerned, the GSMA introduced the uh, technical spec. Now, this is in about 2014, so it's quite some time ago. Um, so is there a danger of, of fragmentation in the iSIM market, do you think, as that develops in, in the same way that there used to be with, uh, with eSIM? Well, I think the need for standards is uh, remains the same for for the very same reasons uh, for integrated SIM. Of course, you may find at, at the moment some propositions that are based on uh, proprietary uh, interpretation of what an integrated SIM should be. Um, but the, the standardization brings a number of, of benefits to all the stakeholders in the ecosystem. The first uh, would be that the security of the uh, integrated SIM uh, will be guaranteed uh, with uh, an industry endorsed evaluation process, security evaluation process of the product. Uh, the other is uh, interoperability and, and therefore this uh, will bring a, a much better scalability. Uh, so Yes, I think uh, for the integrated SIM, the industry has taken the right approach to uh, to standardize it. Also, like the like the embedded SIM, the uh, the standardization uh, is very very well advanced because you have the specification uh, already available. And now we are more in a in, in the process of uh, uh, implementing the standards, certifying our products uh, in order to be ready for commercial launch. So fragmentation will exist, but uh, what we believe at LS is that uh, we need to go for the standardized version of integrated SIM as soon as possible. And this is exactly what we're doing. Laurent, if the GSMA's iSIM standards are already drafted, is it just a case now of hurry up and wait for iSIMs to arrive? And what are the next steps to get iSIMs actually deployed? Um, actually, iSIM standards are more than drafted because current GSMA standards and certification process already takes into account the integrated SIM specificities. But what needs to be understood is that uh, SIM or uh, embedded SIM operating system today are hosted in highly secure chip, which are designed to resist to all kinds of logical and physical attacks. And independent labs will put this hardware to the test using state-of-the-art expertise and very extensive equipment to perform very sophisticated attacks, such as side channel attacks, port injection attacks. So for the SOC to resist to these same sophisticated attacks, which is a requirement to pass uh, GSMA certification, the SOC makers need to redesign their chips to include the same hardware countermeasures which are currently implemented on discrete SIM chips, like uh, sensors that will detect all kinds of glitches or perturbation coming from the external world. So the next step is in order to have iSIM widely deployed and accepted by the ecosystem is to wait for SOC new designs, which will be able to pass those certifications. So in the meantime, there could be some proprietary implementation, but they won't be endorsed by GSMA, may not be trusted by all the MNOs, so basically they won't be scalable. So just picking up on that, Laurent, the iSIM is activated in a two-step process, uh, as far as we understand. Does that reduce complexity? Okay, let's take a step back and look at the embedded SIM. So what we call the activation is the loading of sensitive assets inside the chip that will be used to ensure the security of the profile management operations, like the download of a new profile or the deletion of an existing one. And the loading of those sensitive assets are done today by the EU ICC manufacturer in secure production facilities, audited by GSMA accredited auditors that will check that the production environment is respecting all the requirements mandated by the GSMA. And this is a heavy process with very stringent requirements that all UICC manufacturers need to go through today. Now, when we talk of integrated SIM, the EUICC manufacturer does not have access to the physical chip because they are directly sent by the SOC maker to the OEM. And then it is the OEM that will load those sensitive data. So without the two-step perso, what that would mean is that each OEM would have had to pass the exact same audits to prove that their production facilities are as secure as EU ICC manufacturers' production sites, which would have been a showstopper for most OEM. 
So that's why the two-step PERSO was created. So with two-step PERSO, the sensitive data are protected by a unique SOC key by the EUICC manufacturer. So by unique SOC key, I mean it will be different on each SOC. Then those protected data will be sent by the EUICC manufacturer to the OEM, which has no way to tamper with the data because they are protected by the SOC key. And each data will only be able to be loaded on the right SOC. So only the right SOC will be able to unlock the protection of the sensitive data on the flight inside the chip when the OEM will load the data on the chip in its facilities. And that thanks to this two-step perso process, so two steps because first step, the SOC maker will load a unique key and second step, second step the EYCC manufacturer will uh, lock the, the data with this key. Thanks to this process, the OEM can avoid the burden to pass any kind of security audits on each of their sites because they will never have access to the sensitive data. Stefan, I'm trying to get a handle on the big picture. How big an impact on the market could iSIMS have? Uh, I, I think recent research suggested that by 2025, there could be 200 million iSIM compliant consumer and IoT devices in use. Now, 200 million devices is a heck of a target in two years. Is that accurate in your view? Yes, I think it is. Um, the, the potential for integrated SIM is very important. Um, and the reason for that is uh, you mentioned IoT and consumer. I think the reasons are a little bit different if we look at these two sides of the market. Um, for IoT, the low power networks and uh, that will allow uh, more devices to to connect easily to uh, gather data and send data uh, to the IoT application, uh, they represent the biggest growth in IoT. Um, so that means the advent of these low power technologies and the integrated SIM, they really uh, come together very nicely, uh, which explain the, uh, the the growth uh, for, for integrated SIM. Um, in the uh, consumer market, the other um, a very interesting segment that will uh, benefit from the integrated team is uh, the, the wearable segment because you have to have a, a very small products, very little space inside the device uh, to implement uh, the, the, the connectivity features. So integrated SIM is a perfect fit there. And also, um, because integrated SIM simplifies the integration or the, the addition of this uh, eSIM functionality inside the device uh, for entry range and the, the lower mid range smartphones, it can be also something very uh, interesting uh, to uh, optimize uh, the, the cost of, uh, of these devices. So we, we believe that this uh, 200 million figures that you, you mentioned is a, a realistic target for integrated SIM. Oh, that's really interesting. So, Laurent, um, what does iSIM offer in terms of secure connectivity? Getting sort of right down to the meaning of iSIM and what it's for. Can you say a bit more about that? And also, is it more secure than eSIM? Is iSIM more secure than eSIM? Okay, so it's not more secure than an eSIM, but it all offers the same level of security. So that's why it's really important to check that an iSIM passed the GSMA certification to prove that it reached the same le security levels. The GSMA certification covers three things. The first one, it ensures that the secure area of the SOC that will host the iSIM OS is as resistant to sophisticated attacks as the chips which are currently used for embedded SIMs. The second thing, it ensures that the sensitive assets loaded by the OEM in their production facilities are also protected thanks to the two-step process I was referring to earlier. Right. So even if there is nothing to do on OEM production site, as I explained before, that process will, however, imply an audit of the SOC maker facilities, where the unique SOC keys will be loaded inside each SOC, and an audit of EUICC maker that will prepare the sensitive data protected by the SOC key. And the last thing covered by GSMA certification is that it ensures that the iSIM is fully compliant with remote SIM provisioning standards, ensuring full interoperability with any remote SIM provisioning compliance servers available in the market, so namely the SMDP plus servers. So Stefan, just to sort of summarize, what are the top three benefits of iSIMs? So the, the top three benefits, I think, we we obviously need to start with the the gain uh, in terms of uh, size that you can achieve so that allows you to implement the uh, cellular connectivity in much more de device types than before 
that will be really the first one. And I think it's important, like I said, in wearables and also in IoT, where you you can find a, a lot of uh, uh, small sensors uh, that will be used for smart cities uh, applications, for instance. The low power consumption is also super important, and it's a it's a, a real difference uh, with the um, the uh, other um, implementation of the of the SIM functionality that that we know today on that are based on dedicated chips. Um, when you think about uh, having, for instance, a smart a water meter deployed in the field for 15 or 20 years that's a lot so every every uh, um, every milliampere <laughs> counts in this case so you really need to be very very careful about the the power consumption of the of the whole device and integrated sim brings uh, definitely uh, an advantage there and the third one uh, which is also very important is uh, the uh, the fact that Integrated SIM is easier uh, to handle for, for OEMs uh, in terms of uh, device design, device validation, certification, and even manufacturing and logistics will be, will be simpler. And this is great also because in IoT, more and more companies who are not um, uh, experts in uh, connecting devices will, will try and connect their devices for the first time. Uh, so having a solution that makes it easier for them uh, to achieve their goals, to launch uh, solutions and devices connected to uh, to the cellular network is great. So here, the integrated seems also bringing lots uh, lots of benefits. Terrific. And Laurent, uh, is it right to say, do you think, that iSIMs represent the next evolutionary phase after eSIM, or would you say that they're they're more likely to coexist? Perhaps. Um, do you think that uh, one will lead to the other, or do you think that they're going on into the market together in uh, in tandem? Well, both are true. They will go in tandem, but I think uh, it's true also to say that the it's the next evolutionary phase for the reasons explained before. So. Uh, to, to develop on that. This is the next step of integration inside a single chip, allowing all the advantages that we already mentioned, like reduced bill of materials, reduced cost, more power, uh, more efficient power consumption, smaller footprint. But this is a complex step uh, to take because a discrete SIM or a discrete embedded SIM is one of the most secure chips you can find today on the market with similar security that what you can find on banking card govern or government electronic documents like electronic ID, driving license. And until now, SOC makers did not decide to move in this direction due to the complexity of implementing this state-of-the-art security. But this has changed now as several SOC makers are moving this way. However, it will take time for all SOC manufacturers to design a secure area inside their chip that will be able to reach the required resistance. So it will start with pioneer SOC makers, with SOC designed mainly for low power cellular modem, for NDI IoT, LTEM, Cat 1 bis. Then it will come to 5G SOCs, but that will take years. So that won't be done overnight. And despite the inexorable iSIM ramp up that we will see, I'm confident that we will keep seeing discrete embedded SIM for many years to come. Okay, that's great. Thank you all. That That is really helpful. Okay, let's unwind for a moment and see what in the world of tech has amused or amazed us lately. Robin, uh, I'm going to ask you to go first. What have you seen? Well, I saw this story from uh, the register and I just, it made me smile. Scammers, scamming, scammers. So <laughs> scammers have scammed their fellow cr cyber criminals out of more than two and a half million dollars on three dark web forums alone. Over the last you know, 12 my months. Heart bleeds. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> oh, I thought that was too much, yeah. I can hardly describe the depths of my indifference to their suffering. <laughs> <laughs> it goes further, actually, because uh, you know, uh, so, some of them are talking about uh, being scammed out of large amounts of money, but then others, um, threat actors seem to be indignant about having their money stolen as anyone else, <laughs> but no matter the amount, because one of them was complaining about being scammed for $2. <laughs> for sheer time wasting, it could hardly be beat. Uh, I must say there was a cheer around the office when we heard about this one. Uh, what I particularly like is that they're all turning their guns on each I other. I think that's terrific, yeah. I mean, the more, the more, the more we get about, the better there. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, and this was on the register. It was in the was register. It? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great story. Great site. Thanks, Robin. I love that. Um, Stefan, what's made you smile in the news lately? 
Well, um, lately I was um, looking at uh, Wire.com and then I found an article on uh, AI uh, generated art. And I was really uh, amazed with uh, what, what is going on at the moment. There are some uh, technologies that uh, you can use as several, I think four, four services that you can use uh, to, uh, uh, for instance, have a, a picture uh, being uh, being designed based on uh, a description that you give uh, of this picture, and basically anybody can turn into into an artist uh, using these uh, these services, and it looks like many many people are embracing it. In the article, they say that uh, more than twenty million images are are actually um, created every day. So maybe not all of them will be uh, uh, really uh, outstanding, uh, but I think it's very interesting to see how we can, with such uh, such technology, uh, have um, access to better design. Actually, uh, maybe in our everyday life, because not everybody is a is a great artist for sure. But if we can <laughs> have something better in general, better design, because more people have access to these tools, I think that's great. And uh, to finish on this one, uh, it was even uh, for professional artists from Pixar working on their movies I was really uh, astonished by by the results of uh, of these tools. So this, this can give you a, a flavor of the the quality of uh, what can be done. I don't think it's going to kill artists. Uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. people will still be there to to give the right the yeah. right indications yeah. to uh, to these tools. But uh, yeah, I think it, maybe it can make the world a little bit nicer. That's great. It probably won't make me into a Leonardo da Vinci though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I found encouraging is the way that um, from this story, AI image generators seem to work best. Certainly in this instance, um, in partnership with artists, as you say, Stefan, mm. it's not by replacing them. I mean, it, it seems to uh, benefit the artist because you uh, or the person in need of the art, you can actually achieve something very quickly and it minimizes the cost and uh, obviates any concerns about uh, copyright. I think copyright is something that is uh, that's important to to consider. There are some some uh, some discussions about it. It seems, according to the to the article, indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a new tool. I think you need to consider it as a new tool, and mm -hmm. and uh, you need to use it in a proper manner. And that's yeah. I think that that's beyond technology. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is it's actually extremely positive, positive. Um, and that story was on Wired.com. Exactly. Good. Well, the link will be in our transcript, as I say. And let us know on LinkedIn what you think about the news. Uh, you'll mostly find me on LinkedIn at Jeremy Cowan. That's C-O-W-A-N. Um, and just before we go, let me say a big thank you first to Robin Duke Woolley of Beecham Research. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Jeremy. Very good to be here. And how can people reach you for a bit more information, Robin? Where can they find you? Info at beachandresearch.com. Brilliant. And our thanks also to Stefan Quetglas of Thales. It's been great to have you with us, Stefan. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. It was a great discussion today. Thank you very much. Really fun. And where can listeners find you? Well, I'm uh, on LinkedIn, obviously, uh, Stefan Quetglas uh, at Thales. Lovely. Uh, plus, big thanks to Laurent Leloup of Thales, today's sponsors. We really appreciate your input, Laurent. Thanks, I really appreciate it being there as well. You can also find me on the LinkedIn, uh, Laurent Leloup at Thales Group. Brilliant. And don't forget, you can subscribe to the Trending Tech Podcast wherever you found us today. So a high five to our fantastic audience around the world. There's now more than 6,000 of you worldwide. So uh, big up to you. And as you know, we give a shout out to anyone who gives five stars on Apple Podcasts and leaves a review because reviews are what help us find new listeners and new listeners to find us. This time, we want to say a Trending Tech thank you to Jin007. They describe the trending tech podcast as, quote, IoT at its best, enjoyable, easy to listen to, but most importantly, informative. Thank you, Jin007. And if you give us a good review at podcasts.apple.com slash digital dash transformation, we could be giving you a shout out next time. So keep checking iot-now.com, vanillaplus.com, and the EE 
www.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai